Welcome to the Garden Angelus, where we talk about flowers, veggies, and all the best dirt. I'm Dee Nash from Guthrie, Oklahoma. And I'm Carol Michael from Indianapolis, Indiana. We call ourselves Garden Angelus because we are evangelists for gardening. We love gardening, and we want others to love it, too. We are also authors and invite you to check out our books, including my book, The 2030-Something Garden Guide, a no-fuss, down-and-dirty gardening 101 for anyone who wants to grow stuff. In my books, including Potted and Pruned, Homegrown and Handpicked, and Seeded and Sodded, my trilogy of gardening humor, and my new book, Creatures and Critters, Who's in My Garden? You can ask for any of our books at your favorite bookstore or find them online wherever books are sold. And speaking of online, you can also find us as The Garden Angelus on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and sometimes Pinterest. And we'd love for you to join our Facebook group, The Garden Angelus Garden Club. And now on to this week's episode. Good morning, Carol. Good morning, Dee. How are you? I am well. Do you have some updates from your garden? I do. I'm very excited to share with you that my sister and I have created a little fairy garden at her house. Ooh, fun. Yes. She lives where we grew up, and there's a huge oak tree that my dad planted, and you would be amazed at how big this thing was. So one day, we were walking around her garden, like a month or so ago, and there was this crevice in the base of the tree, and I says, oh, that's the perfect place for a fairy garden, and she agreed. And so, a month later... Did you put in a fairy door? Yeah. A month later, we went back, and we... we and I had a little fairy door and little trinkets and different things. And we tried to put the fairy garden in that crevice. And we both decided that the door was a bit too big. Uh huh. But when you start buying fairy garden stuff, you kind of have to decide what scale you're going to use and then stick with that scale. It's kind of like back when trains were a big thing. Remember yes. scale on trains? Except they're not labeled like you just have to eyeball them. Right. So we ended up moving the fairy garden a quarter way around the tree and it looks really cute and where it is when when she gets out of her car from a long day at work and she works as an infection preventionist in a hospital Mm. so she comes home tired and grumpy and she will see the fairy garden right there so we decided that was the perfect spot she can sit on her patio and drink some iced tea and look at her fairy garden right How, how nice so what are you harvesting I am harvesting. I picked several messes of green beans, some cucumbers and squash, a couple of peppers, a few cherry tomatoes. But I feel like that the temperatures are back into the 80s this week. Mm -hmm. I feel like by next week, I'm going to be telling you about a big tomato harvest. We'll see. Oh, good. Speaking of big tomato harvests at my house, the larger slicer tomatoes have slowed down somewhat, which is okay because... I had so many, I was awash in them. But now the San Marzanos and the Romas, remember how we were talking about Blossom and Drought last time or the time before? Yep. Well, all of those have settled down now. I got rid of all the ones with Blossom and Drought, and now they are producing like crazy, like crazy. Like I I took two big panfuls and roasted them and put them in the freezer, and then I've got another giant amount that I think I'm going to turn into tomato soup for dinner tonight. And then, um, yeah, doesn't that sound good? I'm, I've I've got to see if I've got a good red pepper to put in there. That sounds good too. Anyway, then in squash land, I've gotten a lot of squash, but I saw a squash bug in the vegapod, but it's my own operator error. I left it open one night. They, I'm telling you, that is bad. One night and then they're attacking you. Right. So we've got, we've got, I have found one. I squished it. And also, um, grasshoppers are driving me crazy. Grasshoppers are everywhere right now. Ooh. I have yet to see one. Yeah, because you live in Indiana and Oklahoma. And paradise. Texas, paradise. Yeah, sometimes. I've been there when it wasn't, I'm just saying. But it's paradise here, but we have grasshoppers. So I put hmm. out Nola Bait, and guess what happened? It rained in July. And so all the Nola Bait got moved off into the dirt. So I think I'm going to go buy some more and try again. So that's, everything's going really well here. Crepe myrtles are blooming. Phlox paniculata is blooming. I hope the butterflies come back. And uh, it's time to deadhead things like roses. Yes, and you note here that you have crabgrass taking over your garden. Ugh. Same here. I pulled so much out of it in the last week. And that's the trick with crabgrass. It's actually an annual grass. 
And so don't let it go, go to, to seed. seed. Yeah. Repeat after me. Do not let crabgrass go to seed. Yeah. Pull it, pull it, pull it, pull it, pull it. Try to get all the roots. And I use my Dutch hoe, my hand hoe, to help me get mine out. And I did weed half of that bed that faces the street. But I've really got to go out there and work on it a little bit. I also checked all my drip irrigation on my pots. And things were not getting watered as much as they needed to. So I gave them a splash of water from the hose. That's basically my report. That's a good report. I did want to report that Sunday late afternoon, Sunday night, we got 0.71 inches of rain, which we desperately needed. Yeah, you guys were in you guys were in real trouble with the rain. We um, had a ton of we're rain. We're okay now. It all came south, you know, because my friend in Minnesota said the same thing, that she was not getting any rain. Really? Yeah, we got two inches. In July. That's a lot for Oklahoma. In a week. Yeah, it was crazy. It's so humid here, but that's okay. Anyway, we have a quote. We do. Boredom is not black licorice, Snicket, she said. There's no reason to share it with me. (laughs) By Lemony Snicket. We loved the Lemony Snicket books. My kids read them. I read them. Bill read them. They were a lot of fun. So would you like to know why I chose this quote? I would because I don't really think it goes, you know. Well, our flower this week. Oh, I know why. Okay. The leaves of the flower we've chosen this week smell like licorice. To you. To To me, me. they smell like mint. To me, they smell like licorice. But I can see it. Okay, what flower are we doing, Carol? Augustaki. Or Augustaki. I've heard it pronounced. I've also heard it pronounced Agastash, but I don't think that's right, even though most people say, you know, Agastash. Um you know who told me to, to say Agostaki? Who? Dan Himes. Well, he would know. He, he, did a big, he did a big talk. This was when we were at Terra Nova. And he said, you guys need to pronounce this Agostaki because it is Greek, not Latin. Hmm. The other, yeah. It's also called giant hyssop or hummingbird mint. Yes. And I think people here mostly call it that. Yes. And the one I have in my garden that is just like, to me, it's like a home run because it's been extremely reliable for at least 10 years, which I think is pretty good out of a perennial. And that's the variety Blue Fortune, which is very common. Okay. So never have ever um, done Blue Fortune ever in my garden. Isn't that crazy? It is crazy. You should try it because I think that you would like it. It is... Pollinator City. I mean, it is like, it bustles like Times Square with pollinators. That's nice. wonder if my honeybees would like it. Probably. They probably would. I see honeybees on it. I see bumblebees. I see wasps. And th- now that it's blooming, it starts blooming here mid-July. This sucker's going to be blooming until late, o- almost into Thanksgiving. There'll be a blooms, as long as it doesn't freeze out. Do you deadhead it? Or does it just keep blooming? Okay. Yeah. Well, I should say it's in the mint family. So I do not deadhead it, except usually around um, September, October. I'll go cut off dead blooms because it could self-sow. Right. I haven't had problems. I don't know that the neighbors are seeing it in their yards either. But it it is wonderful. So as we said, in the mint family, so it has square stems. And yes. um, you said that you have a funny story about mint, don't we all? Yes. Well, <laughs> when I was in high school, so we're going to go back yeah, a to ways. 1977. And I worked at the garden center of a Kmart as a cashier. Yeah. And they had these little things of mint for like 10 cents or something. And I didn't know anything. I hadn't been to horticulture school. So I bought this 10 cent pack of mint plant. And I planted it on the side of the yard at my dad's by the fence where I live. It's still there. And so it's still there. <laughs> I knew it. So my sister and I came around the corner to that side because she wanted to show me they, they've got it all fixed up. with, And it's really pretty. And by the fence there. You should explain that your sister lives there. She lives there. Still. She lives, still yeah, lives there. She bought the house. So by the fence, she says, and there's the mint. And literally, this is it was a spearmint. It's like four feet tall and blooming like crazy. It's just going nuts. And I'm like, I wonder who planted that. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't tell her, did you? She knows I planted it. 
That's funny. Um, well, Agassiz doesn't spread like that. No. Because mint has underground runners. Yes. So in my case, I grow one from Bustani Plant Farm called Bolero. And you should try it if you can find it because it's really, really beautiful. It has, it's got great big plumes of purple and it's got really dark leaves. It's just a pretty, pretty plant. And I also grow a couple others in my garden. Um, it doesn't come back for me from winter very well because of drainage issues, which we're going to talk about more in a minute. But I grow Golden Jubilee, which has those, you know, lemon yellow leaves and purple blooms. And um, it's been in my container for two years, out on the deck, no less. And because containers have such great da- drainage, it comes back every year. So it's not so much a hardiness issue with Agostaki. It is uh, drainage. It, you know, it does not like... It likes sharp drainage. It does not like to be bogged. That's that is correct. And the ones we've talked about so far, are like the blue and into purple, but there are some that are like yellow and oranges. And I grew one called yeah. Kudos Yellow, which is a hybrid. And I've grown that. I did not have much success with it. In, Me neither. In fact, after I made these show notes, I thought, where is that? And I went out to the perennial bed where it should be, and I. I didn't see it at all. So I think that it is not there. But it's very pretty when it does bloom. Right. I've lost several of those. There's Tango, which is orange, and Heat Wave is red, and then Kudos Yellow is sort of a, well, it's yellow. I've grown Kudos Yellow, and I grew Heat Wave, and I grew them both in containers, and they both did not come back. So there you go. Unlike some perennials that really don't bloom well the first year, those would bloom well in a container in the first year. And so they may be just worthy container plants. Right. So something you grow as an annual, which isn't an annual. Exactly. Which... But that's okay. I mean, you know, we grow tropical plants and grow them as annuals. Why not grow some perennials as annuals? I exactly. Do. They call them around here, like foxglove. Um, they call them temperennials. Yeah. Temperennials. <laughs> They may or may not come back, but they make great right. container plants. So that may be what those agostakis are good for. Because they are beautiful and they bloom profusely. As does Blue Fortune. But yes. like you said, full sun, well-drained soil. Don't let them get wet in the wintertime where they sitting in, you know, wet soil. They don't like that. Right. They like it hot. They like hot summers. So... According to American Meadows, they say they are big-time self-sowers. You said that you hadn't noticed them self-sowing, and I have never had them self-sow. And I'm wondering this because on that Blue Fortune, I do trim back the seed heads when they've done blooming. So, listeners, we're just letting you know. If you grow Blue Fortune or some of the others, you might want to deadhead them in fall if you don't want more. If you want more, well, then don't. And then you'll get more, and then you can make a decision later. Right, because they're not hard to scratch out. I mean, it's not like they have a super deep root system. And I've paired them with some ornamental grasses, the likes of which I cannot remember the name, and also my daylily hyperion, which is big yellow flowers. And so it's around the utility box in the front, so it hides all that. It's really nice. The only thing that I kind of think "Mm, was that a good idea is Blue Fortune. Like I said, attracts pollinators. It's right by the sidewalk, so. If you walk by and you're afraid of bees, you might get all weirded out, but they're not going to bother you because Blue Fortune's right there. Blue Fortune's right there. Right, they're in a garden. Yeah, they don't want anything to do with you. We have, you know, bees, people worry a lot about bees in gardens, but rarely does anybody ever get harassed by a bee in a garden. Unless you've opened their beehive a couple of days before and they're still really upset with you. And then they'll buzz me sometimes. But well, that's, that's an unusual That's you, case. Dee. That's you. Yeah. That's you and your bees. You're, you have yeah, a personal relationship a whole... with your bees. I don't have a personal relationship with these bees. They leave me and alone. And sometimes, sometimes it's acrimonious, our personal relationship. That's the way it goes. I had another thought about Hyperion. Let's just talk about it for a second. Hyperion. The daylily? Yes. Hyperion the daylily. If you're going to grow one daylily in your garden, grow Hyperion. That would be I my... agree. And there's a reason, there's a couple of reasons why. One is it's a lovely lemon yellow daylily, which is unusual. 
right. it attracts pollinators. Right. It looks really good with blue. I actually have mine with Russian sage, and it looks amazing every year. Yes, it looks fabulous. And so it goes well in gardens as a simple shape. Little frogs love it. Pollinators love it. And here's the last thing. Can you guess what it is? I know what it is, D. Tell me. Scent. It's scented. And it has a lovely scent. It smells exactly. so good. So if we could, it's an old, old day lily. In fact, it's considered an antique and it's cheap. You can find it lots and lots of places, but it is delicate, beautiful, fits into any garden. And when we say delicate, we don't mean as in a fussy way. We mean it's a no. delicate, lovely lemon flower, but it is tough as nails. It is. Mine blooms out in my two front beds that face the street and it, it gets crowded by other things. It doesn't get as much water as the rest of the garden. I'm just telling you, it's a nice day, Lily. Yeah. It's, it's like that little old lady that doesn't get ruffled by much of anything because she's seen it all. She's seen it all. That's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> no. So we, have a, we have another quote. You want me to do it? Sure. The law of harvest is to reap more than you sow. Sow an act and you reap a habit. Sow a habit and you reap a character. Sow a character and you reap a destiny. James Allen. Wow, that's a good one. In case, I mean, because we've been having lots of discussions about all kinds of things because of COVID. Um, yeah, I'm trying to break some habits right now, which we can talk about another day. And it is, it's not the easiest thing to do. Right. I love this quote because, well... I couldn't find a quote about peppers, which we're really going to talk about, that our peppers are starting to really produce. And so I started most of mine from seed, and um, I'm really... Me too. I'll tell you one problem with them, but you've been having some great pepper luck this season. Oh my gosh, so much pepper luck, except, you know how I love my shishito peppers? I do know that. I think I think they're getting too much shade. So my friend Karen Collier called me yesterday or day before texted me and said, hey, I have tons of shishitos. Come and get some. And she lives in the city. So Bill and I drove yesterday to the city to get some peppers um, from her because mine aren't producing. I mean, they're growing fine, but they're not producing like hers are. But um, my other peppers, my pimentos, my poblanos, my, oh gosh, confetti, fish peppers, Ancho chilies, Mad Hatter, yummy peppers, which is a mild pepper like confetti. They are all just, I'm a wash in peppers, and yet I love shishito so much. So Karen said, she handed me a big paper bag full, and she said, put these in your freezer. Just freeze them direct, right? Uh -huh. And she goes, in this winter when you're missing your garden, pull them out and saute them in a pan with a little olive oil, salt, and pepper, and she said, you will feel like you're right back in a summer day. Nice. So I, did. I do that with green beans sometimes. Yep, me too. So I'm just having a really good pepper year. How about you? I'm having an okay pepper year, but it's still early. Um, some of my favorites to grow are the Cubanelle, but I really... I love Cubanelles. They're good. I'm a sentimentalist. I got to grow the variety of green pepper called Big Bertha. Or the garden is ruined for me. I had to have Big Bertha. <laughs> See, I, I've grown Big Bertha, but I'm just not into her anymore. Oh, really? I pushed her aside. I did. I pushed her aside for the smaller <sighs> frying type peppers, like confetti or fish peppers, which we should say confetti peppers are variegated foliage, right? Yep. And fish peppers are variegated foliage. But don't get them confused, people, because confetti is mild and fish peppers are hot. Yep. That's so true. you don't want to accidentally pop a fish pepper in your mouth and uh, be upset. That's correct. And so be ready for it. <laughs> we wanted to talk about the pride and problems with preppers. And you have the pride and I've got a little bit of the problem. And so are you having some problems? More mm -hmm. so than in the past years, they keep dropping leaves. So I, I looked it up because we don't have every answer right off the top of our head. And I'd never had this much I leaf drop. So up. The, What'd they say? Well, the internets was really helpful. It said it could be because you're overwatering or it could be because you're underwatering. <laughs> I'm sorry to laugh. But, uh, I just I mean, looked at it. I thought, isn't well, that the way the internet always is? <laughs> I did water the garden a couple of times when we didn't get rain, but now we've gotten some rain periodically. And it's like, well, I'm not going to control the amount of water these peppers get. 
I'm still getting a few peppers. I'm not sweating it. I mean, it's like they're they're leggy, but they've got good foliage on top, so I think they're coming out of it. They probably are. You probably it was probably that drought you guys had. Yeah, which lasted a couple of weeks. But I th- I think I just need to, and I'll probably do it tomorrow morning. Go through and clean up all that foliage, because the other thing it could be a bacterial leaf spot. I don't think it's that. But again, if you have, think you have any sign of a disease, you pull that away from the garden and throw it away. Right. And also, you don't plant peppers in the same place you planted tomatoes. Right. You should tell people that. So anything that is in the Solanaceae family, did you catch that? I said that. You did. I'm excited. The, which is the, what is that? The, not, I'm trying to Nightshade family. Thank you, nightshade. I kept thinking potato, which is, yes, part of it too, right? And mm-hmm. potato yes, part of it. And petunias. So you've got to be careful. Yeah, and petunias. So don't put petunias, potatoes, peppers, or tomatoes in the same spot over and over and over again. Right. Which is something I fight. So that's why I grew them all in containers this year, except for just a few. Isn't eggplants part of that group too? It is. Yeah, and guess what foods D likes the best? Nightshade Eggplants, family. tomatoes, peppers. Yeah, I like them the best. So. what I should mention, too, that every once in a while, believe it or not, you'll get blossom in rot on peppers, where the bottom of the pepper starts to rot out. Yes, which we've been finding blossom in rot like crazy in Oklahoma with everything, because it has been weirdly wet here. But now we're drying back out. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting year. Also, here... Grasshoppers eat peppers. I did not know that. So do stink bugs. They like tomatoes and peppers. The little stink bugs with the shield. Yeah. That suck the stuff out. Yes. And I'll also say that they like the ones with thin walls because they're probably easier to pierce with their yes. little mouth parts. Yeah. And cubanelle is a very thin walled pepper as a rule. Almost all the peppers I grow now are very thin walled, except for your big Bertha. She's not. No. Pimento's not. No. Pimento has thick, thick walls. So you're going to laugh. Guess what I did yesterday? Other than go get those uh, shishitos. What did you do? You won't guess because I didn't tell you. <laughs> we drove out to a farm called Riziki Farm, which is out in Jones, Oklahoma. And we went out there and I bought, <laughs> I bought hatch chili peppers. I have heard of hatch chili peppers. These were the mild ones. They roast them on site, but the lady in front of me bought all the roasted ones. So I bought mine fresh, and then Bill and I grilled them on the grill, and I stuck them in the fridge, and I'm going to use them probably in a recipe tonight and then freeze the rest. And they're another thing that you'll, you know, they can only call them hatch peppers if they're grown in the hatch New Mexico area. Right. That's what I was going to say. You can't grow them here. You got to buy them. Brought in from and they're about three inches long. Yeah. They're really cool. So I bought some of those, which was really funny because I could have just bought them at Whole Foods, but I drove all the way out there. And I was standing, I didn't tell you this either, I was standing at that place watching the lady in front of me buy eight pounds of roasted peppers and picking out my mild ones. And then this lady walked up behind me and she said, Dean Ash, what are you doing all the way out here? And really? I said, I said, trying to get some hatch peppers, and we both started laughing. And then I said, and some cucumbers, because my cucumbers are only about an inch long right now. So not only do I grow peppers, but I go buy peppers, because I'm crazy. You are crazy. I'm not that big a pepper fan. I just like them cooked in food, but I would never eat one just to eat one. I ate one last night, Hmm. roasted, with my dinner um, from the co-op, we got some delicious bratwurst. But anyway, anything else we wanted to say about peppers? Not yet. I mean, if I get a big pepper harvest, our listeners are going to be the first to know. So you might want to label your peppers in the garden back to our fish confetti. Oh, yeah, that's you important. Cause you don't want to get the wrong pepper. Because you won't remember. I, I mean, a bell pepper, you know, is mild. But some of those other peppers, you kind of look at and say, hot or mild? And you kind of want to know before you bite into it. Or throw it yeah. in your meatloaf or whatever you do with it. Yeah, I'm actually thinking about making a um, an enchilada casserole. Doesn't that sound good? Yeah, and remember before we said it's fine to grow mild peppers with hot peppers. This would right. be the one reason why you want to say, I'm going to put the mild peppers on this end of the garden, and I'm going to put the hot peppers on that end of the garden. And then if I lose my labels, at least I know everything I pick over on the one side is mild, and everything I pick on the other side is hot. That is one reason to split them. 
Right, because you could lose your labels. Like, for example, out here, um, I have a whole family of crows, a multi-generational family, and they like to pull out my labels in the spring because they think it's funny. Because crows have a weird sense of humor. Correct. So let's go on to our bookshelf, and I wanted to give a shout-out to a book called Garden Mosaics, 19 Beautiful Projects to Make for Your Garden by Emma Biggs and Tessa Hunkin. And this came to me as a review book. And the funny thing is, I've been thinking about doing a garden mosaic of some kind, like for years. And then suddenly having this book, I think, I could actually do this. Yeah, you could. It's not hard. I've done it. I like to work. I've made a small stepping stone once, but I like to work stepping with, stones. I like to work with tools. And I think that this is not something that is easily, you know, you don't have to be an artist in terms of I know how to draw because I can't draw very well. To make a beautiful mosaic. And this just gives you tons of ideas to make like a wall panel or do the top of a little table or do like some little stepping stones. Right. So I. And you can even buy kits. Yes. Too. So you can read this book and then you could go and buy a kit or you could use found stuff or broken china if you have some broken china around yeah um and i had another thought about this too and i so oh i know it's hands-on yes we wanted to talk about tactile experiences and that fits in with our book yeah and this would be a very tactile hands-on experience which is kind of something that i think we need more of these days i do too I've really been reducing my social media footprint because I realized I was spending way too much time on it every single day, just wasting my life. And so um, not that not talking with everybody that we talk with is wasting our lives because it's not, that's not it. I was, it's just addictive. So this would be another good thing to do instead of so much social media. Right. And when we say that, we like to do purposeful social media. So interact with our listeners, uh, post a few updates on Instagram, but both weaning ourselves off the endless scrolling just to see what's out there kind of stuff. Right. Because we're both reading digital minimalism and it really opens your eyes to how addictive some of this social media is. And I Right. And that's... No. And that's Digital Minimalism by Cal Newport. And we'll, we're going to go ahead and put a link to that, too, okay. since we, we mentioned it. Um, but anyway, I was, this is a pretty good book. I yeah. think I'm going to make a mosaic. I don't know when. Um, i got to sort of get my wits about me and put a mask on and head out to the craft store and see what kind of supplies they have and see what I have around the house. Mm-hmm. Use a found object. That'd be fun. So. Yeah, because then that's upcycling and we aren't wasting stuff. So that's good, too. Exactly. Now, when, when my kids were little, when they were little bitty, my husband made me um, deals with their handprints and footprints in the garden. They don't have mosaics. I have made mosaics. But these particular things are just their little handprints, and then you scratch their names in them. And they're, stepping, they're like steps in my garden. And people, well, that's cute. Yeah, people notice them all the time. Claire's is separate because she was born four years after everybody else. But Megan and, and Brennan's are together. And then Ashley was already out of the house or a teenager by the time we did that. So You need to do footprints of your granddaughter. I think we need to add that, don't we? Okay, well, I'll, let, I'll let her get just a little bit bigger and I'll make a stepping stone for her. Yeah, when she gets mobile on her feet. I've been posting on Instagram, speaking of pictures of her on my story, where she has like this irritated look on her face, and it makes me laugh so hard. I can see what kind of teenager she's going to be. All righty, so All right. we have another quote. You do it. Yeah, because we've been, we've been chattering along. Yes, Happiness is a butterfly, which when pursued is always just beyond your grasp, but which, if you will sit down quietly, may alight upon you. Nathaniel Hawthorne. That is a really nice quote that you picked out for our dirt. Our dirt is... I thought it was a wonderful quote. Our dirt is, I finally registered my garden as a monarch way station. It was already a pollinator garden, whatever pollinator thing. But monarchwatch.org has a a deal where you can get a sign that says monarch way station. Um, To have a monarch way station, you have to answer certain questions to make sure you have habitat for monarchs. Biggest thing with monarchs is you need nectar plants and you need milkweed. Those are the, those are the two things you need for, but you also have to have water and a couple other things. So 
my garden has been a Monarch Way Station for years and years, but I was on my Monarch Butterfly Facebook group, which I do still go and talk on the groups and listen to other great experts about monarchs and other butterflies and bees. Anyway, one of, a, one of my friends on there, she said, Dee, you really need to label your deal a Monarch Ray Station and you need to write about it on your blog. And she's just right, I do. But I thought we'd talk about it on the podcast first. So I also okay. got tags. That's the other part of this. You get tags and you tag monarchs as they come through. And then you register them with monarchwatch.org. And if the butterflies happen to be found down in Mexico or wherever and reported, then they put it on their website, and it helps them know how the butterflies are flying through the area, how they're migrating. Very nice. That's kind of it's exciting. So once you get your blog post done, we'll, we'll maybe retroactively put that on the show notes. We won't have it this time, obviously. but No, no, we won't. All right. Well, very good. That is our episode for this week. We want to thank everyone for listening to The Garden Angelus. If you like our podcast, please tell your friends about us. And if you listen on Apple Podcasts, we'd love a five-star review. That helps us get noticed by others and by the almighty algorithm. Exactly. And be sure and check out our show notes for links to information about today's topics, plus links to our own websites. It was lovely to chat with all of you over the Garden Gate today. Bye until next week. Bye.